Hey engineering students, welcome to week four. This is the first video of our week. And uh, let's do a little bit of housekeeping to start off with. Um, and by the way, if you're wondering why I'm using Google Meet to do this video, it's because I think I'm going to get a slightly better video quality. Um, there's a few technical reasons why, but um, let's try this for a second. First of all, if you don't yet understand, if you didn't read the um, announcement that I put on our stream, first of all, you should have. If you didn't get the email reminder that you have an announcement, make sure that's enabled. But um, make sure you understand that when you submit one of those uh, assignments that is a photo upload, um, I'm actually writing comments on that and I'm like tagging different parts of your uh, photo upload because I want you to know what you did wrong, obviously. So you can find those if you um, if you click on the, the little thumbnail image of the upload that you did. Okay, so you go back into the assignment, click on that little thumbnail, don't accidentally click on the X because that'll delete the file. And it's going to kind of temporarily pop onto the screen. And then there's the three little dots in the top right corner. So you click on those and you tell it to open in a new window. And then when it does that, it'll be like a new tab or a new window. Then you'll see all the comments. I don't know why it's not easier than that, but it's not as far as I can tell. I tried a few different things with Teleos the other week and it just didn't work. So that's the only way that I know of. Now, I also want to announce to you today before we get into the lesson proper that we have this uh, pretty cool project coming up and I want to kind of hang this out there in front of you so that you don't get too discouraged with all the math. Um, most of you are doing great and I know that some of you are finding this hard. You know, this is, it is supposed to be hard. It's, it is, it's supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to challenge you and lift you to the next level and that hurts just like athletic activity hurts when it's making you stronger. But here's a little bit of motivation for you. The first project that we're going to do this semester is going to put to work all of the things that you learned about statics, all the vectors and forces in particular, about how forces are supposed to be balanced and all equal out to be zero. That's the, the chief idea of statics, remember? We're going to start by designing and building a piece of furniture. Okay, we did this a couple of years ago. Um, for those who had a class last year in room 102, that piece of furniture at the front of the room, uh, that, that tall standing desk, that was a, the winning piece of furniture that was designed by the prior year's uh, group. That was by uh, Claire and Ava, actually. And it was, it was awesome. And it wasn't perfect as well. It had some problems, and I think it's gone back to Ava's house now. I think she has it. Um, but we're going to do that project again, but with some uh, little twists. So firstly, I'm going to say this year that the furniture piece that we design, it's going to have to have something incorporated that is either electrical or mechanical. Okay, the furniture piece that you design in, in teams, by the way, is going to have to have some kind of electrical or mechanical aspect to it. That could be as simple as like a built-in hidden recessed lighting, like it plugs into a wall or maybe even is battery powered, like with LEDs. And there's a little, you know, subtle switch somewhere and then like it illuminates a desk. Okay, that could be one example. Um, more complex... Here we go, let me show you some things. You could design the, uh, like a desk or a, sure, let's just keep saying desk for now, that has a motorized linear actuator. That's what all these are on the screen. Um, and these pair with a little controller and they plug into a wall. And so this would actually, um, you know, have some kind of motion component, like maybe it's a standing desk that like raises up to a different height, you know, based on where the user is sitting or standing. Um, something in, in that kind of category, okay? It could be a, a secret drawer. It could be a uh, some kind of adjustment that gets made. And the reason why this is going to be a thing is because um, I'm still working out the exact details, but I've got a very passionate partner right now in PathPoint. PathPoint is a 
is an organization just down the street from our Providence Canon Perdido campus. And they work with um, residents who have, you know, some kind of mobile disability in particular, or, uh, you know, like they, you know, have an, have an arm that doesn't work, or they uh, don't have full control of their limbs or something like that. And um, they offer services to those uh, residents and they particularly focus on art as you can see in the in the picture like kind of art therapy sort of things and getting them uh, employment many of you actually toured there a couple of years ago this is uh 2019 this is january 2019 I remember doing this big robot giant hand project that was so awesome this is on on our blog site uh prov hyphen eng Dot blogspot.com and we went and visited Pathpoint and there's a bunch of you right there look at Caleb Goss's hair and uh, we walked around and, and met uh, a bunch of the residents and we also saw there was a um, you might recall there was a uh, art machine where the person could control on like a little pad or something I forget like maybe a stylus and then there was like almost like a big two-dimensional 3d printer sort of thing that like you know slid the paintbrush or the pen whatever it was around a big canvas to actually do the painting kind of like magnifying what they did so i wanted to design something that will actually benefit their residents so i'm working with uh, gil addison over there he's actually uh, in that photo gil is right there on the second from the left and gil is very passionate about providing things that could actually help and, uh, and and allowing us to kind of take a stab at that. So I'm I'm pretty excited to do that. We may also accept other proposals as well from uh, possibly from Providence teachers at both campuses. Um, some kind of furniture or classroom equipment that is you know going to be primarily constructed of wood. It's very easy to machine to gather, but has something electrical or mechanical. It could also be manual, by the way. They could simply be like, you know, like a parallelogram style struts that like, you know, you sort of flip it up and like locks into place. It doesn't have to be powered mechanical, but it will have some kind of mobile or electrical aspect. So I'm really excited for that. That's going to be happening somewhere around week sort of seven or eight is when we will um, actually start brainstorming those and get those, those briefs, as they're called, like a a design brief from our client where they tell us what they want and why so keep an eye out for it and plug away with the mathematics and the physics it's preparing you to be able to do that kind of thing with skill and excellence all right we are going to switch over to the whiteboard and we'll uh, get into the lesson proper so this first reading was about how to add vectors together. And specifically, I want you to understand that we are really just talking about adding vectors together. Um, it is possible to subtract, okay? Uh, subtraction is really just adding a negative vector. I would not worry about that though. A negative vector just means the direction is the same but flipped backwards. Magnitude stays the same, direction just points the other way. I would not worry about it, I would just think of adding positive vectors. Some of you had good questions along those lines in the discussion boards. Um, it is possible to multiply vectors, but it gets really weird. Vectors are a thing unto themselves. They're not like ordinary numbers. There's actually two ways to multiply vectors. You can do what is called the cross product. You know how we use a little x sometimes to denote multiplication so in vectors that actually means something the cross product because there's also another one called the dot product okay you know how sometimes in math we also use a dot to show multiplication well when it comes to vectors a cross product and a dot product mean two different things you get a different results it's uh it's interesting and i'm not going to cover it in this course but enough to know there are at least two types of multiplication out there and then when it comes to uh, dividing vectors, you simply can not. 
as far as I can tell, I looked around online, you can't divide vectors. So we are really just going to focus on what you can do, and that is adding vectors. That's all we'll need to do. Um, now, the one thing you must know is that in order to add vectors, you must have the same units. Okay. Absolutely critical. Um, and this is just like in, in regular algebra, actually, in regular uh, physics formulas. You know, you you could, um, you know, you can say that uh, if you have 20 kilograms and you want to add it to 30 kilograms, that is 50 kilograms. However, if you have 20 kilograms and you want to add it to 30, let's say, meters per second, it's just impossible. You just can't. Okay, you'll you'll never actually run into a proper like a well set up equation that looks like that. It doesn't exist. Even things you might think are kind of related, like uh, five meters per second, which is a velocity. It might feel like you could maybe add that to like ten meters per second squared which is an acceleration because you know velocity and acceleration feel kind of the same or related at least but you can't okay you just cannot and you can't do it in an inline equation like these and you can't do it with vectors either okay so if you have a rocket ship okay um look at that isn't that awesome there's a little window for the guy, a little fin there. You could have a rocket ship which has a um, an acceleration of 20 meters per second squared and a velocity of 100 meters per second. Those might be things that are both happening. Look, there could e there could even be you know like a I don't know like a wind force of something happening, but you can't add those together because the units are different. The force, by the way, is going to be measured in newtons if you're in the SI system or pounds if you're in US customary. Okay, so that's it. That's pretty easy. It means that most vectors actually can't be added each to the other. Uh, we're talking about the specific case where they have the same units. And I guess that is what typically happens because we don't bother with things that we can't do. So, um, the, the stuff that the textbook talked about this week, which uh, it looks like started on page 79, the first reading, um, we have actually already kind of done this adding vectors together in the way that I'm going to do it today. And let me try something here. Mr. Hurt told me that I can simply do this with my whiteboard. I don't have to delete everything every time. That's kind of cool. Um, we talked about a situation where a woman walked 300 feet north. Now, let me actually set up a scale here. Let's, let's say each square is going to represent 50 feet. I'm talking about the actual green grid squares in this video. Let's call them 50 feet. We're going to do things to scale. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So in the... Um, I believe it was the week two, uh, you know, lengthier assignment. Maybe it was the week three. I'm sorry, it was the, well, you know, whichever week it was. A woman walked 300 feet north. So that, she starts here, let's say. And she went 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. Okay, there she is. 300 feet north. And by the way, I guess it's, Seems obvious to me, but maybe you don't remember, but never eat soggy wheat bix. You remember that? Look at that beautiful compass rose. That's called a compass rose, by the way. Um, now I just really want to get fancy. Oh man, there's no hope for me. I like how they're kind of colored. I don't know. It just makes me happy. I can't explain it. Um, so you go 300 feet north, and then she turns and she goes 150 feet east. Okay, 50, 100, 150. There we go. 
150 feet east. Okay. In this case, by the way, the word north and the word east are the direction. That's why it's a vector. Magnitude plus direction. 300 foot north. 150 foot east. I don't have to write north or east on the diagram. Uh, that comes from the direction of the arrow. So the question in that in that assignment was, what was her total displacement vector? So I'll do it in the blue. That was this vector right here. And I think it was fairly obvious, or it should have been, that this is a right angled triangle. And because of that fact, um, you can use the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so you would have Pythagorean theorem. You would have used that. And you know what? Let me pull open my calculator. I don't have that value in front of me, but I will in just a second. All right, 335. Let's keep it three significant figures. 335 feet. Remember, by the way, 300 feet, that is ambiguous. How many, how many sig figs is 300? Well, it actually isn't clear. How many sig figs is 150? It's actually ambiguous. Um, I'm going to say that they were both given to three. That's why I answered back to three. You never know for sure until you do scientific notation. Okay, so we did that Pythagorean theorem. You know the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. The C has to be the hypotenuse. The A and the B are the other two. And this is actually the exact same thing that I'm going to walk through today. But I have to give you some more tools in your hand because um, this was a particularly easy situation. It was easy for a few reasons. First of all, um, well, no, actually, let me let me start elsewhere. First of all, there were only two vectors, the ones in the black, 300, 150, that made up the original problem. Now, if you were in the advanced group, you had three vectors because one of them was, well, you did this problem, then we added a third vector that went up because the lady took an elevator straight up into the air. And, um, you know, the basic group, the ninth and 10th graders, just be glad you don't have to do that. Um, it was also particularly easy because the vectors were, um, they were just like horizontal and vertical. The, the word actually that I could use is they were orthogonal. Fancy word, don't worry too much about it. Orthogonal means like everything was at right angles, okay? Just like the X and Y axes on a Cartesian plane are, or the X, Y, Z axes on a three-dimensional plane, or the three-dimensional field. Um, they were orthogonal vectors. They were perfectly aligned horizontally and vertically. So that turned it into a perfect right angle triangle. Um, the fact there were only two of them meant we could use the Pythagorean theorem, or if you did three, you use like the the uh, the amplified Pythagorean theorem, which I think is really cool. Um, but what you're doing here is kind of like a special case of a more general method that is going to help you when you don't have just two, or when they're not purely horizontal or vertical. So the name that we're going to give to this Oh, I ran out of, I hit the edge. I hit the edge. Here we go. I'm going to have to do it this way. The name going to, oh man, I hit the edge again. <laughs> there we go. Let's go there. Oh, Mr. Hurt has led me astray. All right, there we go. Um, we are going to call this method today the head to tail rule. And I think I've done this with some of you before, the older ones, um, 11th and 12th graders, I'm pretty certain we've done it. But you're going to see it all over again, and you're going to be absolute pros at it this time. The head to tail rule. This is a cool method, but it is a pictorial method. Okay, it is a graphing method. So what that means is this method is 
only as good as your ability to draw. That might sound like an insult. Okay, some of you might receive that as an insult. I'd probably feel that way if someone told me that this method is only as good as your, you know, innate athletic ability. I'd be like, okay then, thanks a lot. Um, this is only as good as your ability to draw. So what I mean is that um, if you stick to a good scale, like drawing to scale, where one grid square always equals a certain amount of something, um, or if you can use computer methods um, to draw things to scale, then these results will make sense. If you don't draw to scale, nothing I'm about to say makes sense. Okay, so you have to either carefully draw to scale or you've got to use computer methods. So, um, if you're going to be drawing by hand to scale, you really need a ruler and a protractor. Protractor, O-R, E-R, O-R. Protractor, if you can draw with a computer, you need some kind of software. And I think this whiteboard app is going to do that for me just fine. So I will show you how that works. So let's, um, let's show a particular um, situation here that uses, let's do three force vectors on an object. Do we have a brown pen? We do have a brown pen. I'm going to draw a American style football simply because it is absolutely something which experiences forces and it is particularly easy to draw. Kind of a sharp ellipsoid. And here we go. We're going to do three force vectors. We're going to say that we have um, and let's, let's draw them all radiating out from one point, just to make it easy. I'm going to have one force vector here. And I am actually, this might sound weird, I'm going to not go to the trouble right now of seeing what those magnitudes are. I'm simply going to call it F subscript 1, okay? Force 1, implying that there's going to be a few of these. And you might also carefully note, I did intentionally draw it from... Um, one grid square intersection. Okay, that's where the dot is in the middle here. And I went to make the tip of the arrow, the very tip of that triangle, at another grid square intersection. I did that so I can really keep track of this. You'll see what I mean. All right, let's give it another force. Let's say the other, the next one is right here. Now, don't ask me what these forces are, from whence they are arising, but it is force number two. Maybe it's wind, maybe it's someone kicking it, maybe it's bouncing off the turf. Um, what else could it be? Oh, its own weight, okay, gravity, that's always a thing. Uh, it could be something that's underwater, it could be experiencing a buoyancy force. There's all sorts of things that could be happening. And then let's do another one that goes like that okay f3 so this kind of thing happens all the time multiple forces not just two and they're at random directions and you know i guess if we really wanted to get into it we could say theta one uh, i'll do it here theta two and let's yeah i'll do two lines and we'll do Theta three. Okay, so these are these are three well-defined vectors. Now they have magnitude f one, f two, f three. They have angle or direction theta one, theta two, theta three. They're fully defined. All I would need is numbers, which I'm not going to give you. Now, what we really want to know though is what is the total force? There's that sigma symbol again, capital Greek S sigma. Um, what is the sum of all the forces happening? And I'm using this here in the very general idea kind of sense, not the rigorous I equals 1, I equals 2, that kind of sense. What is the sum of all the forces? And we want to know this because in the end, a bunch of forces actually really just summarize down to one force. Just like um, you can have a bank account and you might put in $20 one day, 
$35 next week. You might take out $5.70 to pay someone, but in the end, you just add it all together. What you really want is the bottom line. You want to know what's the end result, what's the net result. And uh, this is what he's talking about on page 79 when he talks about uh, like a hundred hyperactive kittens and trying to um, <laughs> work out what the net result is. Why deal with a hundred hyperactive kittens when you can deal with just one? Okay, great. Well, we have three hyperactive kittens on our screen right now, the three forces, and let's make them one. And we can add them all together because, as we said earlier, they do have the same units. Okay, so this does work. Okay, Mr. Hurt. I'll agree, that was actually kind of useful. Um, so the way you add this up is you you pick, let's see, I think I will, I think I will redraw it. Um, I, I won't redraw the football, but I will redraw those three vectors. So you, you pick any of the three vectors to begin with. I'm gonna start with F1 simply because it is the number one. But you don't have to. You can start with any vector that you choose. And so I'm going to start by redrawing that. And notice how easy that is because of how I made it, you know, snap to those grid corners. Uh, actually, I can see what's going to happen here. So let me just quickly... Do that slightly decay F1. Now I take the second vector. When I say the second, I mean whichever one you want to be second. I will choose uh, F2 because it is the next in numerical order, but it could have been F3. It doesn't matter. And you draw the next one with the head of the previous one to the tail of the next. That's why it's called the head to tail method. So here I go. Um, I'm taking F2 and looking carefully at those grid squares. That is it right there. Okay. F2, you can see I went like across two to the left and then down by one. All right. I hope you can see that. It's the exact same. I could have used different colors. That would have been good. Maybe next time. And then I'm going to take the last of the vectors that I'm adding together. This is sigma f we're adding. And again, I go head to tail. I attach this last vector's tail to that previous head, the head of f2. And that is like this. Okay, f3. See that? I went at F3, you can see back in the original sketch, went across 4 and down 4. And that's what I have here as well. Cross 4, down 4. Now, there is absolutely going to be some practice doing this in your assignment this week. So make sure you're tracking this and, you know, take that practice when it comes. Now, the last step here, after you add together all of them, you can say this is step one if you like. Step one is to add them all head to tail. Step two is to find the resultant. The resultant is a word that I've used many times already. Um, sometimes when we hear words that we haven't yet been formally introduced to, we kind of have a habit of glossing over them. I know that's how it is when I you know, learn my you know, Spanish vocabulary or whatever it might be. Um, but the word resultant just means like, what is that net effect? What is the sum total of everything that is happening? What's the result? Okay. What's the outcome? So the resultant now gets drawn also. I'm just going to say it again, because I want you to have this phrase in your head. It also gets drawn head to tail. I guess the, the difference here, I'll change over to uh, purple. The difference is that we go from the very first tail, now we go straight to the very last head. Just like that. And I will, I will actually use the capital letter R 
I can use any, like I could have called it F subscript R, F subscript T for total. I'll just use R for resultant to remind you that's what's happening here. All right. That is the resultant. What's this saying is that um, even though this football is experiencing one, two, three forces, F1, F2, F3, when you add that all together with all their different crazy directions and magnitudes, what you actually get, you could, you could wipe it all away and you could actually say, you know what, this, no, that won't do. This football is really actually just experiencing that right there. And again, this is why I did it locked to the grid squares so I could easily redraw them. All right. That is what we're saying. That whole diagram can be replaced with that diagram. Now, there is no way that you could glance at that first diagram, look at all the random craziness, all those hyperactive kittens, and say, oh yeah, this is what's going to happen. It's going to go you know, to the left and down and exactly this amount. But with this method, you actually can. Okay, and if you had, let's say that you had defined already what this scale was, you know, you, you already set up and you said, you know, this is like two newtons in each direction or 10 pounds or whatever it is, then you could actually now go to this resultant and you could say, hey, look at this. We have six newtons there, two newtons there. 2 squared plus 6 squared and take the square root, 2 squared. I didn't need to do a calculator to do that, did I? We have 6.3. Yes, I know I went one more significant figure than I should have. Sometimes I just don't care. It feels, feels right. Okay, 6.3 newtons. And I've worked that out. I don't have any equations, any math on the page anywhere. All I have is accurate drawings, but I will, I will write that again. Accurate drawings. If your drawings are not accurate in terms of uh, magnitude and direction, this does not work. Okay. That's what I was trying to say here. This is only as good as your ability to draw. So either use a ruler, graph paper, Protractor, you know, let me let me actually add to that. Um, I'm going to add graph paper to this list because nothing I did just then would not have worked on physical paper. Um, or if you have computer software, and I'll show you that now as well. Okay, let me just check. I haven't forgotten anything here. Um, yeah. Oh, you know, there was one phrase that I that I have used already. And I just want to say it again. Um, when I say it is only as good as your ability to draw, really the phrase that I'm meaning, I said it a week or two ago, length is proportional to strength. Sorry. Okay, that's the phrase to remember. The length effect is proportional to the strength. Now, um, the other thing missing from that resultant is the angle, the particular angle. I'm, I'm not wanting to go too hard on you 9th and 10th graders, but for 11th and 12th graders, I would hope that you'd be able to work out the angle, that you would be able to set a reference, okay, and get the angle. I'm going to go theta subscript R for the angle of the resultant. I'd hope that you could do that using your arc sine or arc cosine or arc tan functions. Okay, in this case, um, it would make the most sense to use arc tan of, uh, let's see, six over two. Okay, that's the two side lengths and arc tan of six over two. Uh, let's see here. Is 71.6. Degrees. Okay, you, you guys should know what I'm talking about there. Um, and ninth and tenth graders, if you want to learn something new and extend yourselves a little bit, I, I, I'm going to try very hard to not ask you those questions. 
but it is right there containing that one line. Arctan just simply means the inverse tan function. It is also it also appears on calculators with a power of with a power of negative one. Both are equal ways to write that arctan or inverse tan or even just say arctan even though you write it tan to the negative one. This does not mean the same thing as like saying six to the power of negative one, which is one sixth. This is actually a name of a separate function. That's why arctan is actually probably my preferred way of saying it these days. Although when I, when I was learning in high school, we only ever wrote it as tan to the minus one. Um, yeah, you just put in those two, those two side links, the horizontal and the vertical. Um, that's what's happening here and here. And then that gives you the angle that you want. That's kind of the black box method. I'm not explaining why that is. I'm just telling you, you can use it as a black box, you know, drop things in, don't understand it, but you still get the same output anyway. All right. Um, the last thing I'll do for you right now is show you another way to do this with computer software. And I really hope that this lets me do it. Um, this time I won't draw an actual object, but I will draw three other vectors and I will now make them kind of a little more just random. Okay. The first one is going to be like this. I will still call it F1. Uh, the second one is going to be like that. We'll still call that F2. And let's see. Third one right here, F3. And no, just to show you, this can be, it doesn't have to be three vectors. I'm going to do F4 like that. Okay, so if you have computer software, like what I'm about to show you, here's another very acceptable way to do it. Um, you can simply grab these objects on your computer page and you can slide them around. Okay, once you've got the original drawing, you're going to assume that's correct. Notice this time I didn't even bother trying to snap to grid squares because I'm not going to need to. And this time as well, as I, as I arrange them in a head to tail chain, I'm not going to bother with the one, two, three, four order because it doesn't actually matter. So I'm going to use my selection tool. Naturally, every computer software works a little differently. Oh dear, is this going to work? Let's see. Oh boy. Not at all what I wanted. <laughs> Please hold. There we go. All right, so I'm going to start by sliding this somewhere to get started with. Now I will grab my next one. I'm going to say, what about F2? Yeah, this is better. And I'm going to carefully line it up just like that. Okay, you see my tail went next to my head. I kind of like this method. This is good. Now I'm going to go, let's see, I'm going to use F1 next. This is good, this is good. Carefully connect that. And then F4. This one's a little awkward because it's really overlapping. In fact, I don't like that. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of mess with it because otherwise they're going to be so hard to reselect. I'm going to put this one as the second one. Let's see if I can do this. See how skillful I am or not with my selecting. Okay. Okay. Let's see. I think I accidentally grabbed a bit of that tail. There we go. So you see part of the thing I'm trying to show you here is that it doesn't. I think I'll just get rid of that little guy. He's out. Um, it doesn't matter what order your chain is. I just originally started with F3, F2, F1, then F4. Then I changed my mind. Now I've gone F3 to F4 to F2 to F1. Doesn't matter. I'll do it in green. The resultant goes from that first tail to that last head. 
okay? That is the net total of all those different forces that are happening, which is cool, easy. Let me show you again. Let me show you what we can mess around with here. I'll, I'll stay. No, actually, let's let's do this. What if I instead started with F1, and then I went next to F2. Sorry, my screen is being a little jumpy. And then I went with F3. And then I went F4. Again, it doesn't matter. In fact, uh, I'm just going to grab the result and I already drew and I'm going to show you look I'm so confident it fits just like a puzzle piece drops right into place right there look at that hey presto it doesn't matter that always feels too good to be true doesn't it, it feels like kind of like a magic trick but it doesn't matter which order you do you'll always get the same result and that is just a beautiful illustration that that's why I love doing doing it that way just to show you um, now, of course, to interpret the results, you would still need to have some kind of scale at some point. You know, either you have a prior scale where each square stands for 10 pounds in both directions, or maybe you have a ruler. Okay, that's another way to do it. You might have a ruler and you hold it up against it. Look at that. I can measure the angle. Looks like about 50. Let's just round off. Let's say that appears to be... Oops. That appears to be uh, 55 degrees based on my ruler, and then um, I guess I, it's hard for me to say exactly what that grid is from this, but you know, you get the idea. I'm just saying that you you can only really do this with a with a protractor and or or, or a good scale in place already. If I had to guess, ooh, I don't know. I'd probably say that that's approximately 25 pounds maybe hard to say but you could do that if you got out your ruler and checked okay that is it that's all I need you to be able to do for this this week um, the second video this week is going to get into the more mathematical way of doing this so I hope this one was kind of a bit of a brain break for you and uh, yeah, don't forget, you can start doing the assignment now if you like, get a bunch of it done. You'll, you should be able to do about half of it already, and then you can pick up the other half later on. All right, happy engineering. We'll see you guys later.